This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center, and we're pleased to be hosting one of the monthly webinars in our MPA webinar series with EBM Tools and Open Channels. And today we have um, Steve Giddings from NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries Program, who's going to be talking about MPAs and Sentinel sites. So I will introduce him in just a second. Before I do, I just wanted to mention that Steve is going to be talking, and then we're going to have uh, Q&A. And we encourage you to write your questions into the question box, and we will facilitate a question and answer period at the end. So um, please feel free to go ahead and jot those down, as, as Steve may talk about things that you have, uh, want to know more about or have questions about. So I will go ahead and um, and introduce Steve, who is the chief scientist for NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries Program. Uh, he works with a program scientist to better understand sanctuary ecosystems, track changing conditions, and reduce human impacts. And from 1992 to 1998, he was the manager of the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary in the Gulf of Mexico. And he has received a BS in biology at Westminster College and an MS and PhD in oceanography at Texas A&M. And he has worked on a wide range of ocean issues. I won't even try to summarize them, but he also has extensive field experience in diving, ROV operations, and submersibles. So Steve? I'm turning it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. I'm assuming you can see the first slide now, the Marine Protected Area slide? Yes. Is that true? OK, good. So I got that technology worked out. <clears throat> so yeah, thanks, and I appreciate everybody's um, attendance and attention. Uh, they, you didn't, I, I'd say thanks for coming out, but you didn't have to come out for this talk, so that's kind of nice. Um, so now, as you can see from the title of the slide, this is a, a Sentinel site related talk, but it's not necessarily restricted to marine sanctuaries, even though some of what I talk about will be related to the, the steps we're taking to try to implement the concept in sanctuaries. Um, I really would like to talk to you a little bit more about the idea of broadening the concept to marine protected areas around the U.S. Because um, as many of you know, because you're familiar with this field, there's a lot of marine protected areas around the U.S. The inventory for the U.S. Marine Protected Area Network has 437, as of this morning, I noticed, marine protected areas listed, and says we cover 4% of U.S. waters. <clears throat> Not sanctuaries, but all kinds of marine protected areas. So uh, significant number for sure, um, and you know, sanctuaries only represent 14 of that 437, I suppose. So the, the MPAs across the U.S. represent virtually every major ecoregion of the U.S. Um, and if you look at that website as well, you can see one of the benefits they describe for the network is for it to provide new opportunities for regional and national cooperation. So I guess I, I'd start by asking uh, just to what extent we really are currently working together as an MPA network, MPA system, and uh, what opportunities should we be acting on that we're not acting on right now. Uh, and I'm here basically to make the case that one of these that I think exist as sentinel sites, ties them all together in a sort of natural and unforced um, way. Um, so it also it would make the network more relevant at the national stage, um, and it also works as well for each individual, you know, each single one at the local level. So I'm here to basically make that case to you today. I think a network could serve a couple critical roles uh, from the standpoint of conservation. And those two are, first of all, listed on this first slide, helping us understand ecosystems much better than we do now, uh, and allowing us to catch problems before they get out of hand. So ecosystem integrity and early warning, getting a better handle on that. That's what we consider Sentinel sites to be all about in the Marine Sanctuary Program, and could apply pretty much anywhere. So virtually all MPAs, as you all know, require monitoring of some sort, uh, looking at resource qualities, um, you know, mostly for the general purpose of protecting ecosystems, but also there are other reasons to monitor, you know, for, for uh, restoration and so forth. But they all have some sort of monitoring programs in place. And a lot of MPAs also allow public visitation or even encourage it and encourage multiple use and extraction in some cases, sanctuaries included. So therefore, there's, a, there's this balance that has to be struck between these two requirements of access and use and protection. So. Um, for, for many of these MPAs, also, you know, there's a, um, a strong need for, uh, 
for ecos tracking ecosystem condition and tracking ecosystem integrity, trying to protect that. Um, and these, this is the sort of characteristic that allows ecosystems to host the communities of organisms that it does and adapt to changing conditions in ways that are consistent with the natural evolution of the place. That's what ecosystem integrity really is. Um, so inf effective management of the places requires this constant tracking of, of condition and, um, and early detection of changes that are occurring, giving us some kind of chance to respond and adapt to those changes and maybe take care of them before they cause you know, cascading effects. So, so this presentation really describes this Sentinel monitoring program that we're talking about in sanctuaries, uh, but, all, but one that could be applied within any MPA. And for us in sanctuaries, the, prim, the priority is to organize the content that we have, the current monitoring content and efforts that we have going on in the sanctuary program uh, in a way, but also to build future capacity to track, to better track ecosystem integrity and provide these early warning indicators. And I believe that com combining forces with other MPAs on the national scale would, uh, you know, create this a rising tide that would help us all do better. <clears throat> so, so why focus on MPAs as sentinel sites? Several reasons. You know, you can see here that they're already known to be special places that people care about. Um, we already have investments of people, and we have built facilities, and I have other assets, um, in to support you know, monitoring, research, education, and other things. And there are places where the public is, is really watching to see how we're doing in, on our nation's conservation front and efforts to, uh, to protect nature. These are some of the messages we've been talking about in sanctuaries, the ways we'd like to see people think of our Sentinel Site program. Um, the first is we believe Sentinel Sites should be intensely studied in monitored areas within marine sanctuaries. In addition, they should inform management by increasing understanding of ecosystems and providing early warning of ecosystem change. And then thirdly, the third main message, uh, a sentinel site program should attract track and support collaboration um, as it advances our conservation science. And that's the you know, basic simple message we're trying to provide with uh, the principles of a sentinel site system. <coughs> In addition um, to those benefits I, I mentioned there, um, there's some other reasons we feel this effort uh, strengthens the, our the Marine Sanctuary Program. And a, a very important outcome would be to, uh, increasing the involvement of communities around the sanctuaries, uh, even more than they're already involved with, with our efforts, uh, but as well as bring science to the Marine, to the, uh, from the Marine Sanctuaries to classrooms all over the country. This is one of the sort of reframing diagrams that I've done to characterize a little better how our how the Sentinel Site program fits into the larger, you know, uh, the larger organization that marine sanctuaries are, the conservation science side at least. Um, you can see we we have monitoring, characterization, and applied research going on and have for many years in marine sanctuaries, but but portions of each one of those, particularly the monitoring, but also the other two feed into this concept of sentinel sites. Because um, you know, certainly that, that um, sentinel site would be a better descriptor of what we do in sanctuaries, tra tracking ecosystem condition and looking for early warnings of change. That's really what, what we've always always been about. But um, here it is more in an organized you know, layout showing how, how our science programs feed into it and how that it in turn feeds out to sanctuary management decisions across the bottom of this diagram uh, from management planning all the way to education and so forth. And along the left side of the diagram you see those the words science, service, and stewardship. You'll hear those throughout NOAA. Uh, that's sort of a characterization of what NOAA believes its, its science should be all about. Servicing you know, the public need and stewardship of resources. So we try to show how Sentinel Site concept fits into to all that from bottom to top. <clears throat> and these are some of the reasons why we're moving in the direction of Sentinel Sites in the Marine Sanctuary Program where, you know, as you know, we're all evolving at a time when there just seem to be no new resources out there. Um, so doing more with less is something we constantly hear about and working together is really the only way to do that. So that's why I'm trying to make this case today for working together across the MPA network. But um, 
we're also trying to develop, you know, improve partnerships and keep ourselves relevant uh, to answer a lot of calls for action that are coming from much higher levels, whether you're talking about the next generation strategic plan at NOAA or, or you know, e even higher national ocean policy level uh, implementation milestones. They call for Sentinel sites. And <clears throat> the, the second bullet there, improving SWIM, system-wide monitoring program, we've been calling that that's what we've been calling this sanctuary monitoring activities for years now, SWIM. And it's, it's considered inside NOAA what they call a system of record, which means they track it and, and ask for data about it all the time. <laughs> it's very hard to provide data on SWIM because it's not, it's so different from sanctuary to sanctuary what's being monitored. You can't say it's just a buoy or it's just an, you know, one observation system or ten observation systems. It's many different kinds of observing systems. So we've got to improve SWIM to make it more consistent with the system of record concept inside NOAA. So these are some of the drivers that are, are taking us down the road of characterizing our programs in the central site concept. And <clears throat> there's another, so you don't, you know, to avoid confusion, <laughs> there are other programs in NOAA and around that use the term sentinel sites quite a bit to describe some of the efforts that, that they're undertaking. One that I'll show you right here is at the NOS level, at one point, we started an um, initiative called Sentinel Sites, but it was focused on a single issue, sea level rise. And, but what's important about this, not so much the issue, but the model used to implement that program, um, we had a working group that we put together for that and created definitions of Sentinel Sites and so forth, all these different words and phrases. Um, but those definitions and the vision for that program and the way it was implemented it could be used in virtually by any institution operating at any geographic scale. So the concept of regional cooperatives which was used to implement the Sentinel site um, program for sea level was done in five different regions creating cooperatives that consisted of numerous government folks in different at different levels, you know, federal and state, uh, academic institutions, um, so forth. There's a lot of different players that were pulled together in these cooperatives in the five different regions to implement a sea level sentinel site program. So um, this slide is really just to say that, that that was one issue taken on by a small group starting at NOS that became ultimately the NOAA sentinel site initiative, which is where it is now, and uh, could apply to what we're doing here as well. So th there's a lot of attention to that Sentinel site or that sea level initiative because from deputy AA levels inside the sanctuaries and reserves, both of us are involved at the, in the cooperatives and in the organization itself of the concept. Um, the National Ocean Service has several offices that operate within these regional uh, bodies and at the national level with organizing it. Um, and there are other federal partners, you know, USGS, EPA, and so forth that work on these regional cooperatives. And like I said before, academic institutions and NGOs and other governments. So it's a pretty stout program right now that's in the implementation phase um, and it's getting a lot of attention. So we want to make sure that we're consistent in principle with what's going on in that program and uh, build on it, maybe into some other issue areas. So, you know, consider that concept, the NOAA Sentinel Site uh, framework that was developed for the sea level change program to be a, an umbrella type concept under which we all can reside with our own monitoring and Sentinel Site requirements um, in that larger context. But to do that, we, and we had a meeting on this not too long ago, trying to make clear and consistent messaging across the different Sentinel Site approaches that are undertaken under this umbrella. Um, you to be a little careful there because it's not like you're in, you're out, just because you have different concepts of the way you need to implement your monitoring. Uh, it's totally legitimate that we have different approaches and that was one of the messages we're trying to give to upper levels of leadership was that you can't be consistent across the board necessarily in every way. But you can share messaging, share terminology, and integrate efforts to the extent that it makes sense across NOAA programs. Um, and I think that's particularly easy for us as marine protected area folks because a lot of us, we have deal with the same issues. Um, we also dis discussed as a group the idea of issue-based growth, moving from sea level 
change to some other issues. Ocean acidification, the most obvious one, could we create sentinel sites to address that issue as well across the U.S. waters? I think the answer is yes, and then the real question is what other issues would we like to take on in the issue-based growth phase for sentinel sites? <clears throat> you also saw this diagram on a previous slide, but it's an important one in a sense because it um, talks about all the different sort of another agreement we came to as a working group for sentinel sites was um, that a fully functioning sentinel site program does more than just establish monitoring stations and observe for a while. But you know the foundational principles of one of, of, of NOAA, as I mentioned before, is to connect science and service and stewardship. Um, sentinel sites do that because they can start with observing, uh, but there are places also where those observed observations can lead to a greater understanding and allow us to predict the consequences of, of different phenomena and address different issues that are going on, use that data and information to inform decisions by resource managers. So you can see it's sort of sentinel sites offer themselves up as a continuum from observations all the way to management and out, you know, outcomes. So another thing in the Marine Sanctuary Program, we feel like, um, and other MPAs as well, fit the criteria that were developed for the original sea level sentinel site program um, and justify the, and the designation of MPAs as sentinel sites. And the yellow circles cover the only part that you really ought to look at here, but the, these are criteria used to select the five regional cooperatives for sea level sentinel sites. Um, and MPAs meet these things very well. Um, we all know that MPAs have certain scientific or ecological uh, significance that justify their you know, existence in the first place and designation. Uh, they're practical places because we've got the infrastructure to support observations and um, we've got the management requirements and the issues to, that deserve uh, observation and, and information gathering. So selection criteria used for sentinel sites applies very well to us. There's also some other terminology and definitions we developed during that sentinel site or sea level initiative. Um, the upper three are just basic definitions of, of concept, but the lower three are more geographic, sort of sentinel stations, sentinel sites, sentinel networks. And um, you can imagine the difference there, sentinel stations being very local observing sites, sentinel sites themselves broader, more comprehensive in terms of what things are looked at, and then sentinel networks is multiple places looking at similar issues across a larger geography. Um, so, you know, I think these, all these ideas on this slide are legitimate and suitable for any program that's trying to organize itself, uh, organize its monitoring programs into a sentinel site framework. So there's just a few quick examples of, of how this concept would be implemented, the different geographies here. This is a simple example of a marine sanctuary with a you know, that's operating as a single sentinel site. I think I got the Florida Keys pointed out here. Um, but it shows that various observing systems and data collected down there in that, in that geography from a number of different stations or station types could be applied to assess uh, and track certain indicators of community condition um, and the human activities that affect them. This is a few of the issues that they're addressing down in the Florida Keys that are priorities for them, benthic diversity, food web structure, you know, visitor impacts, and so forth. Those would vary from place to place, but you've got to design your monitoring first and foremost around those issues you care about. Um, and some of those might apply at a larger scale, but first and foremost, you've got to address those concerns. Thinking in terms of a, a sentinel network across multiple marine sanctuaries, lionfish issue is an easy, an easy one. Uh, we know that it, which sanctuaries it's affecting now and which ones it's most likely to threaten. So tracking the uh, movement of an, and development of invasive species populations is something that we're really keen on and uh, working inside sanctuaries and with other entities to do that. So you can imagine there are different parts of the country have different issues that they were going to track as a regional or a network in a network situation. Here's another type of a a network that's facing a specific issue like uh, whale strikes. Multiple oceans here, multiple sanctuaries, some sanctuaries are, some are not affected by whale strikes, so we just pick the ones that are, the ones that care about it, and address the issue within those sites, and then hopefully transfer technologies or concepts that are developed in that initiative 
to other places outside the sanctuary system. And that's happening to some extent. Stellwagen's doing a really good job uh, with the whale strike issue and trying to, you know, put out apps for ships that tell you where whales are and whether you need to slow down or not for the next, you know, 24 hours. So it's very sophisticated up there, the directions they're going. So that technology can be transferred uh, outside the program as well. So that's a whale strike network. Here's thinking in terms of, you know, what do all marine sanctuaries care about? You can ask the same thing about MPAs in general. But, um, you know, biodiversity observing. Now, I think, you know, you all are pretty familiar that that's a hot topic now. There's even a RFP out, or I guess proposals went in for, for biodiversity observing network um, research. And <clears throat> this is a concept that all sanctuaries care about, so there might be some consistencies across the whole system that we want to put into our monitoring programs to address that. And then another slightly different look at it. Imagine the Gulf of Mexico as a region and, and it, where you might want to address a couple different issues across the relevant geography for those issues. Here's, here are two, sea level change and ocean acidification. Um, start with sea level change here in red. There are obviously clearly a number of different places you, you need to be tracking sea level to watch a change and look at its impacts on coastal environments across the whole region. Some of those, I have the, some of the marine uh, eastern research reserves that are, exist in that region listed, but there are also places outside those reserves that would be relevant places, you know, Galveston Bay and so forth, Tampa Bay, that might not be NERS, but NERS would be part of a larger system in, the, in the, that geography to look at sea level change. Same goes with acidification. Some marine sanctuaries like Florida Keys and Flower Gardens or uh, Grays Reef as well are, are affected by sea level change. I mean by uh, acidification, but there are a number of other places we'd want to be looking at that phenomenon as well to uh, track its impacts and get a better perspective on the, the regional changes that are going on beyond just the marine sanctuaries. So this is the, you know, answers the question, how do MPAs fit into larger networks of uh, sentinel sites? <clears throat> and just to give you one quick example, there's a, a, a going back to the sea level change concept first. Uh, the Gulf of the Farallons is one of our sanctuaries that's been pretty heavily involved with um, working with the public on adapting to sea level change. And it, it demonstrates that entire spectrum of science to stewardship as it relates to that issue. This particular site's been active and became part of the Sentinel site, I mean the sea level cooperative for the Bay Area. I think that's what they called it, the Bay Area Sea Level Cooperative, um, as part of that Sentinel Site Network out there. And they're still heavily involved with that particular activity. So you can Google our coast, our future, if you want to know more about that. But that's where we're taking science, working with other agencies, USGS included, you know, for modeling sea level change, and then talking with community members during meetings and workshops to ask those questions about what things need to change in terms of future planning uh, to address or to prepare for changes that are imminent in the next few decades. <clears throat> now we went at a workshop recently to talk about some of the priority issues that we saw in the sanctuaries that we think ought to be initially worked on in a, sea level, in a sentinel site context. So, these are the ones that we've talked about that seem to rise to the top. Some of them I've already mentioned, invasive species, and biodiversity, uh, acidification, climate change, but you can see there are a few others. Uh, noise is one of those emerging issues that we need to address and track and decide whether, you know, what, what we want to say about it. Um, so these, these are just what we consider priority issues, and we're going to try to design and develop our Sentinel site build out from this issue-based perspective and start issue by issue uh, building our, our capabilities around them. To, to do that implementation, you know, I think initially we're going to focus on repackaging and marketing more than we are any kinds of new investment. There's just no new money out there. Our monitoring programs in sanctuaries are really not as good as we like them to be. And in some cases, you'd be surprised how depauperate they are. Um, it's really not good in some cases. So, But what we do have going on and what other 
partners have going on, we can package in ways that make them more meaningful, more helpful to decision making. So, so we considered a priority to build this framework um, by putting our monitoring research out there under a single umbrella, this Sentinel site concept, and putting a spotlight on it uh, by, you know, through the, through, through this basic infrastructure of web-based content. Uh, and as time goes on, we think that this, you know, this certainly will attract people to the sanctuaries more so than they're even attracted to them now to leverage resources from our partners um, and as well as involve citizens more you know in that and volunteer monitoring programs and then uh, so this initial investments is on accumulating existing information and building this web capability uh, and then the growth phase hopefully eventually you know when funds emerge and other things happen filling gaps in our monitoring programs and uh, you know, focusing more on getting partner investment inside sanctuaries by, by that attraction that happens. And these are some of the activities that I think uh, will help move us from sort of concept to reality. Uh, we've already conducted this monitoring inventory of the marine sanctuaries, getting together information about all the projects and programs that are going on inside the sanctuaries. The rest of the steps involve you know, building this web presence, um, I think a critical step to make it real to the rest of the world and to us, the, the whole concept of several sites, um, and showing what sanctuaries have to offer, uh, where the research and monitoring is already conducted through mapping exercise that we're going to be doing, and um, then working with the existing programs that are out there, the sea level change sites, acidification studies that are going on, in some sanctuaries and outside, and as resources become more available, uh, making you know just making this more sophisticated, improving the web capabilities, linking our initiatives to uh, to our periodic outputs of condition reports, which I think some of you are familiar with, but uh, linking the data coming from Sentinel sites to those reports is a critical step for us in, in out years, um, and then eventually using the, the program to support education efforts as well. So, and just, just to point out, though, that there are some very good things going on in some of the marine sanctuaries already, and this is just a quick list I made last minute because I felt like I may be giving them short shrift, but you know, a lot of you are familiar with the Sanctuary Integrated Monitoring Network website out in Monterey, which has tremendous amount of resources available, information on as far as uh, monitoring goes in the Monterey area. And that's expanding to include some of the other West Coast sanctuaries as well. So between that and some efforts they're doing in Monterey to establish what they're calling ecologically significant areas, CESAs, that's going to help support the Sentinel site uh, development in that sanctuary for sure, and uh, elsewhere along the West Coast. There, there's other West Coast efforts like Beach Watch and Limpets that are, that are uh, mostly coastal monitoring efforts, but they're very good. And uh, we got to you know, package those as well been always, you know, recognizing the value that they that they have standing alone as well, because some of these have websites for them already. I mentioned Stellwagen has this uh, pretty sophisticated whale alert system that they've already got up. The Flower Garden's long-term monitoring study has been going on for quite a long time now, and among all the sanctuaries, it's probably the most comprehensive and uh, consistent program that's happened. Um, but you know, a lot of people don't know about it because it's just not packaged well right now in terms of getting that information back out. So I think Sentinel Sites will help along those lines. Gray's Reef has a research area that's got data coming in from it, uh, but again, it's got to be packaged the right way. Um, and then, as you know, some of you are familiar with the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program that's under development. Even packaging information like that in a Sentinel Site concept or website uh, would be helpful to get that information out to the public. So I really was going to just finish with this, and that's to ask you all, um, you know, what you all think in terms of could this, could such an MPA network across the U.S., you know, what could it do? What could it, what could it um, take on? What issues could it stand up for? Um, could it even, you know, could it get enough attention on the national stage to become this voice for the oceans in some, some ways, coastal oceans at least? And um, what would it take to make that happen? 
So I haven't tried to answer any of these myself yet because I just threw them up there today. <laughs> but um, this is the kind of thing we'd need to talk to talk about uh, if we wanted to make anything happen and along the lines of a Sentinel Network for Marine Protected Areas across the U.S. So with that, uh, I just open it up to any discussion or questions anybody might have. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, sure. I'm going to go ahead and ask people if they have questions to go ahead and type them in and we'll um, get a, a discussion going via your questions. Um, Steve, I did have a question just to get things started. You mentioned maps of priority observation locations. Are those areas where uh, observations are already happening or where you would like them to happen, and how are those identified? Yeah, they're mostly areas that we have to start by mapping places that already exist, either because they're you know, instrumented or they, have, or they have regular transects or whatever that happened there, and they have for years, because getting that information together is our first step. But there are probably also going to be places that emerge as um, priority hotspots for whatever issue they, they exist. Um, and they're going to have to become areas where we try to focus people's attention in the future because they're, they're priority areas for that reason. So, but I think we start with existing and, and priority areas for the future need TBD. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so again, hey, hey, Lauren, yeah, yeah. Just one other point on that. One of the reasons we want to have those all on a map is so that potential partners just have a concept of where things have been done in the past, where they might be able to get data to support the work that they might want to do. So that's one of the reasons we want that tool out there. Right, and I guess I would just add that um, you know the IUS regional associations obviously have a, a big role to play in terms yeah. of. Um, observations and it seems like that would be a natural partner. I don't know how much you've already, have you talked to them much in terms of this concept? Well the different marine sanctuaries do work regularly with IU's folks at the regional level so they would definitely be a major partner, no question about that. Okay and here I have a, a, I have a question from Ron Britton who says it would be nice to be able to add and link coastal national wildlife refuges too. We've been trying to gather much of this information on a case-by-case uh, refuge by refuge approach, and this could be a great collaboration. Yeah, that's a good point. To me, that's one of those groups that fit right in with the MPA concept. So, yeah. so a question I have, just following up on Ron's question, is: um, Have you had any of those initial conversations with the other uh, MPA agencies about, you know, do you monitor similar parameters, or how could the data be sort of maybe put in the same place? Those kinds of questions. No, I haven't at a programmatic level had those discussions. I'm sure some of the individual marine sanctuaries have talked with local, you know, partners, the estuarine reserves and others, national seashores and, and beyond, to sort of collaborate on various things. But nothing formal has happened at a larger scale, the scale that I'm working at. Okay. Yeah, so the, the individual sanctuaries that have probably had those discussions have worked, I'm, I'm sure they they do it because they have their own issues that they're trying to do, address and the own monitoring programs they're trying to develop and they're just trying to be as efficient as they can by, by working with the partners in the area. Plus some of them have, might have watershed related uh, concerns and issues that they're trying to address. So Monterey, for example, has a water uh, protection plan and protection coordinators and it, you know, they work with upland folks all the time. Right. So I suspect strongly they've had those discussions. And and Ron is pointing out in his question that uh, you know having the programs in two different departments in commerce and interior does make it more of a challenge. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's any insight you have from your work with the NERS in terms of how how you've made some of those connections uh, between programs, but within NOAA. Well. And no, the only way we've done it so far is being assigned to a working group that was cross NOS working group. So we were sort of forced together, and somebody said, "Come up with a Sentinel site concept that involves all the different NOS offices." Because, well, it, to be frank with you, it started because NOS is constantly looking for the answer to the question: What makes us relevant as a as a service? What, what holds us together? NOS has a bunch of different disparate sort of approaches to 
to their jobs, and uh, very seldom do, the, do they come together for any significant purpose. But Sentinel Sites was one of those things that leadership thought would help bring us together, and it, in fact, it has on sea level. But one of the reasons we focused on sea level is because there's a significant amount of expertise across NOS in sea level, and management needs that um, need to take it into account. So we're looking now for the future. What other issues can NOS take on that it's strong in and that it has a need for? So, but but it was a, a little bit of a forced family that happened with the development of the Sentinel Site program as it is now, and. But if you look at a particular issue and pull the partners together for that issue, if everybody really cares about it, they'll work together and coordinate their activities. So I think we could, you know, I think that's why we focused on issues, because people care about certain issues. Let's take on the important things. Lionfish is a big one right now. Doesn't, maybe it doesn't rise to Sentinel site organizational stuff, but we're, we're actually talking with XPRIZE and other agencies about coming up with solutions to the lionfish problem in the southeast. As long as you find an issue people care about, I think we can. I think those um, partnerships will naturally happen. Okay. Well, we have a couple of other questions. The first is uh, from Diana Crespo asking if all 14 sanctuaries are sentinel sites. And then the next, I'll just go ahead and read it out, is that it's uh, from Vicki Goldstein, that it's a fantastic idea to create a broad-based MPA network with community support and it would really uh, connect beyond coastal communities and into the heartland states. And maybe we should think about connections with migrating birds who need stopovers as they move from marine MPAs to other regions. Yeah, well, that's definitely I agree with Vicki on that one. She's from Colorado, so <laughs> she's, got a, she's got definitely the interest in, in talking about the heartland and how it affects the coast and how the coast affects the heartland. So um, Vicki's been a really strong advocate of that idea, so appreciate that comment. Um, the, the, remind me, Lauren, write the comment right before it, the Diane. Uh, yeah, it was about whether all 14 sanctuaries are sentinel sites. Oh, yeah, that's a tricky, you know, road. That we're saying yes, but it's almost a, an answer that doesn't matter. We're characterizing sanctuaries as sentinel sites because they fit the concept of what we're trying to accomplish. That's understanding ecosystem integrity and tracking and providing for, you know, early warning capabilities. We know all sanctuaries need that promote those things. And so we're saying that under that principle, yes, sanctuaries are sentinel sites. We had talked about, you know, are there places within sanctuaries that ought to be called sentinel sites? Or are because some geographies on sanctuaries, as you know, are huge. Is the whole thing one sentinel site or what? Well, that's a hard that's always been a hard one to negotiate. Um, the way I'm seeing it now, there are going to be stations within sanctuaries like there are now that we can call sentinel stations that support the needs of the larger sentinel site, which is basically the marine sanctuary um, requirements for ecosystems and early warning. Uh, and that those could fit into larger networks of, sanctuary, um, of sentinel sites that include sanctuaries among other types of places. So it's all a matter of phrasing there, but for now we're saying sanctuaries are sentinel sites. Okay. Some people go, what's that really mean? <laughs> and they always will, but I can't worry about that too much. And you gave some interesting examples of how a network could be built around, out around some, some issues, like lionfish. Is there, would you say that that lionfish network is something that exists or is an idea for the future, or, or some of the other networks that you, um, that you suggested? Yeah, it, it doesn't exist. The only thing that exists, I guess you'd say, is the, um, the sea level change cooperatives, which are five different places where they're operating as in a way that a sentinel site network would. Um, so, but lionfish right now, of course, a lot of people are looking at it, and we all have these regional plans that are being developed for lionfish and little booklets and on and on. Uh, but, but nobody's really monitoring and tracking lionfish in a in a way that I would say is consistent with the principles that I laid out. But it doesn't take too much effort to go to the USGS website or or, or um, the reef website and look at a nice uh, set of outputs that track lionfish change over time. So they've done a good job at tracking them throughout this, this region, even though it, it wouldn't, wasn't ever set up as a sentinel site, per se. So that, that's one that's a little bit of low-hanging fruit. We could work closely with the lionfish experts in the region to, to put that kind of thing together. 
Right. Well, I know that certainly that's a big issue across all MPAs in the region. For sure. All right. I'm going to just ask our participants on the line if anyone else has any questions that they would like to, uh, to put to Steve. Well, um, please go ahead and type them in if you do. And in the meantime, Steve, I guess I, I don't know if you have any other uh, last words you want to say to the group, or I, I think this has been really fascinating and, uh, and it has great potential. I think the comments that you made about the potential of the national system to participate as Sentinel sites is a, is a really great one, and obviously Ron's comments and others about the, the, the linkages with national wildlife refuges or even inland areas. Um, on a species basis or a shared resources basis makes a ton of sense. I think that the question you're struggling with is, you know, how do we get from here to there with the resource issues that we're facing? And I, I think you've laid out a really, um, you know, sensible plan for the, for the broader network. Yeah, there's, um, there's, there's the resource issue, but there's also the um, communication issue. Because to me, it's, this has always been limited by lack of communication between different entities. And even at the sanctuary level, back when I was working in the field, a lot of opportunities that were probably missed just because we failed to communicate between, you know, the sanctuary program and some other program that was relevant at the time or should have been relevant to some issue. So it still starts with communication, which really doesn't cost very much. <laughs> so it's not always a resource issue, and that's why we're proposing to start with uh, this sort of basic web capability to, to make it real in people's eyes so they can at least click somewhere and find out how we're thinking and what issues we're talking about. Well, and along those lines, we do have one more question from Nancy Wright, who asks, um, how, do you en how do you envision how you're going to move from concept to implementation? Yeah. And well, the, the short answer is we're going to start with the website <laughs> and uh, that get some basic framework stuff down on paper, down on, you know, on the web, obviously, um, so that we can start building from there and tackling it a few issues at a time. Uh, and we'll be working with the sanctuaries out in the field to do that. We, we're putting together now an AOP, a work plan for um, Sentinel sites for FY14, and we're going to just have to we're going to start with that. Start simple. Okay. And then I do have one more question from Matthew Vandersandy, who asks um, that you mentioned a lack of consistent variables that are measured or monitored across the sanctuaries, and is there a push to create a minimum standard of monitoring variables? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. We've has scratched our heads so many years over that very, very thing. Um, there's no push to do it right now, but, but we have written a couple little pieces that said if, if somebody forced us and if the resources were available, these are the few things that we think all marine sanctuaries should measure. And some of that's been in response to, well, back when Nancy Foster originally said there ought to be a system-wide monitoring program in sanctuaries. What would that mean to you? Well, that, that's what she was thinking. Maybe there are some certain things that should be measured across the system. It had never worked out because it didn't make sense at the time. We didn't have the resources to do it either. Um, and then it came up again when we started testing um, uh, the gliders, you know, the wave gliders. Well, what would be really cool to attach to wave gliders to measure constantly inside sanctuaries aspects of water quality? And you can imagine what some of those, you know, six or eight variables might be. But um, again, there was never, never any resources to actually make that happen. So we don't have gliders and we don't have consistent measurements from site to site now. Even though we, we all know that it would be a nice thing to do, we just haven't had the luxury of doing it yet. Um, but, but it's not being pushed right now, not just because it's not a priority or not a, um, because resources aren't there, but because we've got a lot of other ducks to get in a row first, like organizing what monitoring there is going on in sanctuaries, which is mostly focused around these high priority problems that each of the sanctuaries faces, and their monitoring programs are built mostly around those. If, if in the end, three or four or five variables have to happen to be common across all those sites after we get it all together, well, then we'll say those are the three or four or five. But that hadn't been our focus. And I have another question from Candace Hall, who's asking, would there be a common data repository for all the Sentinel sites? Um, that's in the out years, because at first we're saying this isn't really about data, you know, decimal point by decimal point. We're talking about getting information together on what the monitoring programs are and basic outputs on what they're finding, trends over time and so forth, as opposed to making the data itself easily accessible. 
Now we'll do what we can in terms of, you know, links inside the website to get you to data when it's available and when it's, you know, accessible. But um, that's not a priority for the initial phase of this development. Okay. But where where we can make it available, we we will. And. Uh, a similar oh, but, question about. Oh, but real quickly, there. Yeah. There, there is no vision yet for a central repository of any sort. We most of the. If any of you know marine sanctuary monitoring, you'll know that a lot of the data is collected by other entities and it's deposited or archived or whatever under guidelines that aren't really dictated by the sanctuary itself. It's those other programs, whether they're academic or other government or whatever. So that's why we're thinking more in terms of links to data than links to data within a central repository that we have control over, okay. at least not now. And then Mo Nelson is asking, what about links to the system-wide monitoring program within NERS? Is this something that could be coordinated uh, and also, you know, knowing that they have identified uh, common parameters to measure yeah. and report? Yeah, the evolution of that was very different than the evolution of system-wide monitoring in sanctuaries, and that's why they're have these nice consistent approaches that involve certain estuarine and water quality and now biodiverse biological uh, parameters. But there's no question we have to we want to link with the swamp program in in the NERS. Uh, but we don't want to the point is that we're not adopting it in a you know to because it just doesn't make sense to measure those same parameters in the ocean where the sanctuaries are. Right. Okay. Well, I think we have answered all the questions that have come in. So I will go ahead and um, and thank you, Steve, very much. Yeah. I think there was a lot of interest in this, and we really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and thanks to Sarah Carr and Nick Wiener for um, their support and involvement in this EBM Tools and Open Channels. And I would just also mention that we are planning on having uh, this this MPA webinar series continue. So just stay tuned. We're going to be putting together the next set of talks, and we will get those out via our usual uh, networks. So thanks very much. Thanks, Lauren. All right.